Hi, I'm Professor McCoy, and the question of the day seems to be, what is a woman? Now, before the last few years, this would have been a very easy question for almost anyone to answer, or at least most people would assume so. Uh, there are, of course, uh, complexities of the issue uh, that, uh, that we can explore from a, uh, from a traditional philosophical standpoint, but that's not really the question that has been uh, on everyone's minds lately. Uh, this question has been brought up in all sorts of contexts, especially in sort of pop philosophy, uh, as you might call it, uh, whether this is uh, looking at the most recently the Supreme Court hearings, uh, whether this is looking at someone like Matt Walsh uh, uh, from the Daily Wire, uh, a political commentator uh, who has been addressing this issue in a lot of different ways on, say, the Dr. Phil show, uh, and also he uh, he's been... Uh, working on apparently some kind of a documentary on the matter, which should be interesting. Uh, in any case, the the question being asked is asked for specific political philosophical reasons. Uh, and this has primarily to do with uh, relatively recent developments uh, in uh, gender theory, critical gender theory, um, anything involving uh, gender or maybe queer theory, basically anything following uh, the tradition of the post-structuralists, so uh, primarily Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida, uh, anything of there having to do with gender, um, possibly even um, tracing this back to uh, de Beauvoir. In any case, though, the question has seemed to have stumped a great deal of people within this particular uh, philosophical and political tradition. Uh, and it has been used by people on the sort of traditionalist right, let's say, uh, as a kind of gotcha question, a way of stumping them and showing flaws or holes uh, in their philosophical framework or their understanding of, uh, of gender, of uh, human persons, of gender relationships, and anything like that. Now, the typical answer given, um, both by, uh, by the sort of traditionalist right type people, um, and expected, therefore, um, and also the, the answer traditionally given by just about anyone uh, would be something along the lines of, if, or if, at least if we speak it very basically, um, would be an adult human female. Right? A woman is an adult human female. Simple, straightforward, right? Um, there are a couple of reasons why the, uh, why the sort of the postmodern, post-structuralist, queer theorist, critical gender theorist, etc., uh, cannot use this as a definition for a woman, and in fact, cannot really provide a coherent non-circular definition of woman. I, of course, uh, being very traditionally minded and being primarily a student of scholastic philosophy of, of pre-modern thought, uh, I tend to place a lot of the blame on this of uh, the blame for this difficulty um, on uh, not the postmodernists or the post-structuralists or even the 20th century. I go back far further than that. Uh, to the philosopher David Hume. It can be argued that these uh, these errors and these problems have deeper roots than that, but I think the primary issues all stem from uh, Hume's rejection of the teleological and of the formal. But to see exactly how and why that makes sense, we have to examine why it is that the postmodern, post-structuralist, etc., let's, uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, the gender theorist, uh, why the gender theorist is incapable of providing a definition of woman, and why they reject the definition of adult human female. There are two general uh, objections to uh, the, to this proposed definition that the, uh, that the gender theorist will, will uh, come back at it with. Uh, one is simple disagreement. Uh, they will point out that according to their understanding, particularly uh, of uh, trans issues and uh, concerning uh, intersex characteristics and things like this, that not not all females are women, and not all women are females. Of course, uh, this leaves open the problem of defining a woman, and this is exactly the problem uh, that the critics are trying to point to by demanding a definition. Uh, what the critics are essentially doing here uh, is they are, uh, they're, they're, um, Functionally speaking, they're doing what Socrates was attempting to do to his contemporaries, trying to press uh, alleged or self-proclaimed experts on a particular topic to define their subject matter. And just like 
uh, just like the ancients that uh, the, the Athenians and others that Socrates spoke to, um, most notably, say, Euthyphro uh, is a perfect example of this sort of thing, uh, we find that the gender theorists are unable to define their key terms. Uh, so again, if you're not familiar with the dialogue of Euthyphro, um, I'll have a link to, a, uh, to the full text of it in the description as well. Uh, Socrates confronts a, uh, a priest, uh, among other things, um, named Euthyphro, on the subject of piety. And he wants to know what it means to be pious. What is pious action? What differentiates piety from impiety? And Euthyphro, this expert on the subject material, the, the, well, the most well-known in all of Athens and therefore uh, in all of Greece, for knowing what piety means and for being the, the foremost expert on piety and being the pious, the, well, presumably at least, being the most pious man in Athens at the time, cannot provide a coherent, non-circular definition of the term. And eventually, like most of the early, uh, Plato's early dialogues, it ends in aporia, uh, unable to come to a resolution for an apparently simple issue. And unfortunately, this kind of aporia is exactly the sort of thing that we often find uh, when, a, uh, when a more traditionalist, conservative type thinker uh, will confront a gender theorist about a definition of woman. We find a kind of aporia, a sort of shrug uh, in agreement to disagree at the very best, uh, although more likely an escalation away from argument uh, towards uh, some sort of aggressive conflict, uh, whether that is legal uh, in some dire cases, uh, or even simply relational, uh, uh, the kind of relational aggression we would expect on uh, from things like uh, um, social media mobbing and that sort of thing, social media shaming, that all that, that, uh, that kind of problem. But most importantly, the argument winds up being abandoned uh, because there can be no resolution, there can be no common ground on the subject. And this is, again, fundamentally because by rejecting this, uh, this definition, uh, by rejecting the, uh, uh, the, I don't know if it's simply, uh, rejecting the union of woman and female, not femaleness and woman, uh, that these are uh, not um, mutually overlapping and mutually exclusive terms, uh, not mutually exclusive, yeah, mutually overlapping, I guess, uh, terms. By saying that there is, there are, uh, there are women who are not female and females who are not women, the gender theorist is left without a solid definitional basis, aside from some attempts that are very similar to the kinds of flawed attempts that we see Socrates criticizing two and a half thousand years ago. Um, the most common of which, of course, is in a woman is someone who identifies as a woman which is of course circular. Now we see um, another, a great example of this would be Matt Walsh uh, in his conversation on the Dr. Phil show. Uh, we saw him confront a gender theorist about uh, this particular definition. Unfortunately, he doesn't uh, explicitly state what's wrong with it. He attempts to demonstrate it uh, by, uh, by asking a series of pointed questions, but I think we can be more precise in this sort of context where we can point out that by defining a woman as one as a person who identifies as a woman. We are treating the label woman as if it is a mere label. It is purely nominalistic. It has no content. It functions similarly in this context as if it were simply a name. And so therefore what we are saying is by asking what a woman is, it is someone who self sorts into the category labeled woman. This is similar, uh, uh, by analogy at least, to the category of people named Sam. The only thing uh, that people of this group, people named Sam, have in common is that they are people. And so, so far we have something at least, we're talking about human beings. And that they call themselves a particular nickname. Now, whether that, is, whether that nickname is short for anything in particular, it may or it may not be. Your full name may be Sam. Sam may be your initials. Sam may be short for Samantha or Samuel or anything else. The only thing this group has in common is the common name, which, is, which has no innate intrinsic meaning, but is only a label. 
it labels individual people. This is how the gender theorist proposed definition of a woman is one who identifies as a woman. This is how this functions in exactly the same way. It is someone who takes upon themselves voluntarily a particular label with no intrinsic meaning. And therefore the, the definition does not function as a definition. All it functions as is a sort of category identifier, a self-identifier uh, with no, uh, no particular connection between the members of that category. Another proposed definition uh, that, that, uh, that we've perhaps seen before is uh, when a woman is asked, what is a woman? Uh, she may reply, I am. Or something like, I know that I am a woman. And therefore that is definitive of what a woman is. But this is also unuseful. And we see these exact same problem at the beginning of Socrates' exchanges with uh, Euthyphro in the dialogue where Euthyphro attempts to define piety in terms of what he is doing now, prosecuting the wrongdoer, no matter who he is, etc. And he gives a set of examples of the kinds of things which are pious, which is like saying that a woman is defined by women, which unfortunately is also meaningless because that is not a definition that is merely an example or a set of examples. And we are left to extrapolate what those have in common, if anything at all. And so if a counterproposal, a, sorry, a coherent and non-circular counterproposal is not available to our adult human female definition of woman, then we're left with, a, with the problem of disagreement being empty. Disagreement is not disagreement with a proposed alternative. It's merely a base assertion that the proposed definition is incorrect with nothing to replace it with. And also, I will add, no principled reason why that definition fails. The other problem that is sometimes proposed, and this is usually uh, proposed by more philosophical astute critics of the, uh, of the more traditional uh, definition, is that adult human female is just as circular as one who identifies as a woman. Professor McCoy here from the editing room. I was almost done editing this, such as it is, uh, when I realized uh, that I was missing something. I happened across a meme, which I'll throw up on the screen right about here, that is just about a perfect illustration of the thing I'm talking about here. Uh, this is, in, in, if so you don't have to look, or so I can explain it in a, uh, a non-comedic way, I suppose. Uh, it is accusing somebody of being a turf, first of all, which is silly and out of place, but regardless. Uh, asking for a definition of a chair, uh, and, the, uh, and the definition proposed is a seat, usually for one person, typically, with, uh, typically being with four legs and a back. And then the meme points out that this also defines a horse, technically. And I think that this perfectly illustrates my point of this entire video, my central thesis, that it completely ignores teleology or final cause, what a thing is for, which is always going to be part of its essential definition. Because if you define a chair as something which is for sitting in, then that is entirely different from a horse. A horse may have a seat, in other words, a place where a human can be seated, but it is not something that is for sitting. And this is also what distinguishes, say, a table from a chair. You can sit on a table, but that doesn't mean it is for sitting in. And that's a very, very important difference that we should always make note of. And this is, again, why uh, we, I think, correctly should blame David Hume for eliminating final causality from our uh, way of analyzing the world. If we still had uh, a way of analyzing things in terms of final causes, then all of this would become all that much clearer. Uh, anyway, back to me from earlier explaining this in a little more detail. And this is because female here is taken to be a very loaded term. What does it mean to be female in the relevant sense? Now, maybe we can say adult and we can distinguish between uh, an adult woman and say a child or a girl. Um, 
and there may be difficulties with this definition in drawing precise lines in, uh, and uh, and differentiating these in a precise enough way to form a definition. But thankfully, that has not been uh, the chief concern of our uh, of our uh, our society today. Sick as it is, we have not quite reached that stage just yet. Some might argue that we have, but I am eternally hopeful. Uh, so that, uh, if that becomes an issue, that will have to, that will have to be another video. Uh, for now, I want to look at female and what femaleness has to do with womanhood. Because by the classical definition, these are separable terms. These are different things, but they are very closely related. And the critic of this definition is going to uh, is going to try to find the distinctions between them and going to try and find what it is to be female that is different from saying one is a woman. And we can, of course, define this perhaps biologically. Uh, we can say that a female uh, is one who gives birth, let's say. Or perhaps a female is one with certain anatomy. Or perhaps a female is someone with certain genetics or chromosomes. Uh, all of these wind up having problems. These problems typically have something to do with exceptions to the rule, which we still want to qualify as part of the category. These are examples of chromosomal abnormalities, for example, um, uh, irregularities in anatomy, so intersex characteristics, that sort of thing. Um, or simply women, who we would still want to qualify as women, and we would still want to qualify as female, uh, who are, say, infertile or who do not have fully functioning anatomy of the relevant uh, sexually dimorphic sort, let's say. Or even if we say that women are those who, uh, who, um, who participate in the birthing half of the reproductive process, if we want to speak of this in very uh, modern terms, it can be more precise as we go, but for now. If we want to say that, then we have this problem of, of defining females in such a way that those who do not reproduce don't qualify. And that certainly isn't the case, or it shouldn't be the case. It's not what's intended uh, by those who propose this as a definition. So if we are to be more precise, and if we are to avoid these problems, we need a further definition of female to fill in our definition of a woman. Unfortunately, um, on our modern metaphysical uh, understanding of the world, this is perhaps impossible. However, that is only on our modern, fairly shallow understanding of the metaphysics of the world. What we are missing is precisely what David Hume got rid of in our metaphysics. And that are that is two of the four causes that Aristotle puts forward. Um, if you're not familiar with Aristotle's four causes, I go into far more detail on it again video in the description below. The two relevant ones are the formal cause and the final cause. We are left, of course, with efficient cause, what, what makes a thing and what puts it into its current configuration. It's a material cause, which is what, that th what a thing is made of. Uh, we might say that a, uh, a woman is one who does certain things. This is speaking in terms of efficient causes, what one causes to occur. And this can't quite be the case, uh, because again, not all women participate in the same actions, even those that are uh, that we would want to say are definitive of femaleness. Similarly, we can't quite say that they have the same material uh, causes, so they have the same, say, anatomy, uh, or the same chromosomal structure, or anything like that, because that isn't the case. There are abnormalities with respect to these sorts of things. This is why I say that the formal cause and the final cause are the most relevant here. Let me explain how this applies. If we were to define anything, any kind of substance, to use the, uh, the classical term, we define it in terms of what it is. And that is primarily with respect to its formal cause. The formal cause of something is what form uh, or configuration or type or nature that it takes. And so by defining a woman as female, we're describing the aspect of her form. The type of thing that she is and the kind of formal structure of her body and personhood. 
Now, this might seem to be the very same thing as saying that she is composed of certain structures, certain anatomy, etc. But that's not quite the case, because the form of something represents its ideal. Again, you'll find more of this in the, in the relevant lectures listed. But the form of something is to speak of its nature, the kind of thing that it is. So to say that part of my form is humanity, I am a human being. What that means is that I have certain characteristics, certain things that are, uh, that are definitive of human beings. For example, I am capable of vision. One of the five senses, which is definitive of, of uh, most animals, certainly human animals, is vision, being able to clearly and distinctly see things in the environment. However, if I remove this technological aid that I have, that allows me to see clearly, I no longer can see, for example, the camera in front of me as anything other than a vaguely black blob. This is essential to me, but not to my nature. My nature is still a sensitive creature, one which is capable of sensation. Part of what it is to be a human is to be able to see things, even if someone were even more blind than I am and were completely missing that capacity. To put it more simply, for another example, dogs are quadrupeds. In other words, they have four legs. But that does not make a three-legged dog, be that from a genetic abnormality or an accident or anything else, any less of a dog. It is still quadrupedal by nature, even if it is missing a leg, or two or three or all four legs. Similarly, and more relevantly to our discussion here, we can define a woman by what she is in a fundamental way. Rather than trying to define femaleness in this case in terms of actual properties held, we can speak of the kinds of properties that beings of this sort have by nature. Aristotle understands nature as uh, natural properties, the whole science of biology, as, the, as a science concerned with things which are true naturally and for the most part. Therefore, it's concerned with things that are definitive of certain kinds of beings or certain kinds of organisms. And so therefore, a female reproductive system is definitive of femaleness and therefore of womanhood, even if it is not functioning properly or completely in a given individual woman. After all, how do we know that it is incompletely functioning? How do we know what it is to be incompletely functioning? If we do not know what it is entirely from the start. We need to. To know that a dog is missing a leg, you, know, you need to know that they ordinarily have four, for example. The other part of this which is missing, and this is, I think, more crucial and uh, all the more so David Hume's fault, is the lack of final causes. Directedness, teleology, ends, the ends of things, the fact that certain things and certain actions, certain structures, all of what, all of these, so basically anything, aims toward a particular end, or toward a, uh, toward a particular goal, something that it seeks, something that it does. And so therefore, we can say that the the female reproductive system is ordered towards the male reproductive system. They're ordered towards one another for a common end that they must work together to accomplish, even if they do not do so. This is to say, for example, that a microphone is for the purpose of picking up and recording audio, even if it's off. If I turned this off and instead I began recording through something else or there was a moment of silence in the recording where you couldn't hear what I was saying, even if that were the case, this mic the microphone here would be the kind of thing which records audio. Again, whether it functions or not. A broken microphone is only definitively a broken microphone because of the microphone. And what defines it as a microphone and what defines it as broken is its functionality, its final cause. 
you can find the same thing with respect to to ourselves with respect to living any other living creature or with respect to any parts of ourselves as well and those parts of ourselves are part of what make us up and part of what give us our particularity and our definition and so what we have is a definition of female we can go a bit deeper here instead of just referring to the woman of the species um, we can point to what it is that separates male and female members of a sexually dimorphic species such as ourselves now the medievals had a uh, a shallower understanding of biology than we do today uh, and so their definition of what is the female of the species is the passive partner in sexual reproduction uh, we can uh, again there's more to this and it's more complicated than it sounds but uh, it is the idea that they receive the seed from the male and then uh, and produce the child from that seed something along those lines and this is also what wound up being the definition which allowed us to compare females across different species now however we have a much more thorough understanding of the microbiology involved in the process of reproduction uh particularly mammalian and uh, animal reproduction and we can say with more detail that uh and also in a more accurate term even uh that the female of the species is that which uh that which carries and provides the larger gamete uh so with any with respect to any animal species that reproduces sexually uh there are two gametes the large and the small in the human or the mammalian context egg and sperm one is larger one is smaller one comes from the female one comes from the male respectively and so we define a woman by being female we define female by the role that that creature plays in the reproductive process of the species even if she never takes part in that reproductive process her body her organs and her being is still ordered towards that outcome if it were to if if she were to participate in that process that is how she would do so now even if she never does or even if she never can we know that there is a fault there because we know what the proper end of the thing is and therefore we know what the formal structure of it all is and we know what the formal structure of femaleness is and therefore what applies to a woman as distinct from a man or as distinct from another animal or as distinct from an inanimate object or as distinct from a pure a purely spiritual being now david hume by eliminating the formal and final causes from our metaphysical understanding of the world eliminated i would argue our ability to define things because if we merely define things by what put them into what put them into their current configuration what designed them what made them and what they are made of there's no thing there which is to be defined and there's no goal towards which it is aiming and so we are stuck with the particular characteristics of a thing we are stuck with its actualities to use another aristotelian term we cannot discuss its potentialities or its powers what it can be naturally what is natural for it to become and then also what it is capable of doing because that isn't included that isn't uh that isn't part of the physical descriptions of the thing and so in summary again i think that this 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 lack of an understanding of formal and final causes is why we have such trouble defining things as simple as woman and as, as important as woman because let's not um let's not discount the importance of uh, our being able to distinguish ourselves from one another and to define what we have in common and what makes us what, and also what makes us unique because without that that capacity for definition um then the term becomes meaningless and all of our discussions of of gender and sexuality and all of the things that a lot of the people who have trouble defining women find to be particularly important to both their lives and to their academic research it all even s's winds up collapsing under its own weight 
Now, to head off any uh, any um, unfounded criticism, um, anyone who takes a position on this on this kind of a matter is is obviously going to be subject to uh, to as I said uh, some perhaps harsh, perhaps undue uh, criticism. I expect no different. Um, suffice it to say that, again, uh, my approach to this is, of course, strictly academic, being an academic myself. Um, I have uh, I have views on the matter, of course, uh, but those views are, are informed academically, and they are primarily about uh, blaming a philosopher from a few hundred years ago for the problems of today. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not one to wade into the politics of the day unless I can. Unless I cannot possibly avoid it. Um, however, when I find that there is a particularly interesting problem that we find in in uh, in the contemporary discussion, that I can find a root for said problems uh, in the things that I am far more interested in, in studying in the in the far past. I can't help myself. So hopefully uh, this conversation will generate more heat than light, uh, more light than heat, let's say, uh, so to speak, and we can have uh, intelligent discussions about these matters. And hopefully as well, uh, this can lend some insight into what is missing from these discussions and why, uh, why it's why it is missing and why it has been missing for so very long. So with that, I suppose I will leave you for next time. Bye.